Welcome back to the Real Freedom Channel. I'm James Spence, and we're going to talk about some reality in real estate today. You know, typically we do a lot of property walkthroughs, show you do's and don'ts, things to look for, pro tips, and that's pretty valuable and we love doing that. But as we explore real people, real situations, real challenges, and real solutions, in this episode, we're gonna introduce you to one of the people in this industry that has been getting it done for quite some time. He's well known all over the country. He's been a real estate agent, a real estate broker, a real estate developer, a real estate investor. He's done some investments in title companies and other assorted things. And the crazy thing is he's doing all that right now at the same time. So he's got a lot to share. He's an amazing guy. He's a lot of fun. I'm very fortunate to be able to call him my friend. And I know you're going to get a whole lot out of meeting Mr. Dylan Tanaka. Hey Dylan, super happy to have you on today. I'm sure everyone wants to know kind of how did you get started? You know, what are you doing right now? What are you excited about? Let's just, let's just learn about Dylan and what, uh, what you're doing right now. Sure thing, James. First of all, I want to tell everybody, uh, I am very excited to be here. So James and I uh, and his wife, Christina, we all met at Investor Fuel, which is a nationwide mastermind that we are both a very big, or all of us, a very big part of. And if it wasn't for our watches, and this is kind of hard to see, James and I have the same exact watch, the only two geniuses in the whole world who bought these watches. And uh, I met some guys from California. I'm from Metro Detroit. So I met these California guys about a decade ago. We were in the pool. We were down in Cancun or something. These guys were all multimillionaires. They rode big dune buggies. And I love this guy's watch. And he's like, yeah, it's a uh, Citizen Echo Drive. And I'm like, I thought I was going to wear a Rolex one day, but I'm still wearing my Citizen Echo Drive. And the only person that James and I both know who wears a Rolex is the only guy who has to dig his hand down in toilets to clean them. And that's our buddy, Kevin Burke. It's kind of funny that the guy who's the contractor has the nicest watch. So True. shout out, shout out to our good friend, Kevin Burke. Um, he's an investor fuel with us also. So that's kind of like the tie that binds us all together. Um, but uh, we're all real estate investors. And, you know, my story is I started way back in 2003, bought my first rental property that was a duplex. My plan was to buy a house like every other year. And then by the end of 30 years, I'd have 15 houses and they'd be paid off by then. And I'd be working my nine to five. And uh, about two years after buying my first property, I think I'd purchased about seven more while working a full-time job. And I said, you know what, this is crazy. And I was under 30 at the time. So I could basically do anything that I wanted, but I did know from, from early on, I had the heart of an entrepreneur. So it was time for me to kind of break free and get serious um, in real estate investing. And I, of course, like everybody, stumbled my way through, went and got my license right away because that's what I thought you were supposed to do. Being from Metro Detroit, um, the beginning of my career was great. And then all of a sudden in 2006, seven and eight, you guys know we had what we call the foreclosure boom. We were one of the worst cities in the entire nation. But for me, that meant a lot of opportunity. So I went from doing a dozen deals a year to 60, 70, almost a hundred deals a year buying them, closing on them, sometimes fixing them up. Um, but there, it was really hard to retail back then. So we would wholesale them, but we closed on everything because it's really hard to assign when it's a bank owned property. So I'm getting kind of deep into the real estate part, but I'll, I'll move through this quickly. So that's, that's what we did. Um, so I was very transactional. I learned how to do deals, learned all kinds of stuff about paperwork, um, all stuff that you don't make money doing. But when you're doing that many transactions, that's just what you have to figure out. Um, but the biggest kind of key for me in my real estate investing business was because we had to have so much cash to buy and sell those properties. We were buying and selling a property um, like every other day, if that makes sense. It's, it, was, it was pretty crazy, right? So if we did 75 transactions in a year, you know, that's like every other day we were buying one and then selling one, buying one and then selling one or every three, three days, something like that. It's a lot of transactions. Tons of transactions. But what's the one thing that you need that a bunch of investors don't need today? We had to have cash. Right. So very early on, I learned that don't trust banks. I, I don't have any money because I'm a kid. My family's normal. A lot of love I got from my family, but not a, not a ton of business um, acumen or, or help in that sense. Um, I've kind of built that over time. I'm still building it, right? A lot of arrows in my back, as our friend Mike Hembright likes to say. <laughs> 
but I spent a lot of time building up my private lender and private money war chest that put me in front of most people in, in my, uh, in my area, maybe, maybe a lot of investors in the nation, to be quite honest, because I always had more money than I needed. So anytime there was an opportunity, I could take it. And unlike some of the newer people, and you guys take this advice, whether you're new or if you're advanced, you don't need to give up half of your deal just to get some money. You have to build private lenders so that you can give them six, seven, eight, nine, maybe 12%. I don't care how much you're giving them, but the, the, the less, the better. And some of the people um, who I wouldn't call them coaching students of mine, but, but people who I help a lot in business here locally for me in Metro Detroit, they're at a point where in their first couple of years, they're borrowing money at 9% from private sellers that they've done deals with, from aunts, from uncles, all that stuff. So right out of the gate, you want to make sure you're working on private money because that is super duper important. That really was the keys to my early success. And then from there, you know, the market got good right in about 2010, 11 here in Metro Detroit, bam. And for 10 years, we've been on a tear. But coming from the foreclosure days and the crazy roller coaster, I'm always apprehensive and, and careful about what's coming next. Yeah. So that's kind of my, my short launch into how I got into real estate. Okay. So that's, that's a, uh, that's a pretty compelling story because, you know, you've done a lot, you've been around a long time, you've seen a lot. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think you and I have talked about this before, but you see a lot of programs and, and things advertised or, you know, how to make money in real estate with no money down. And, you know, you know, my impression of that is that, you know, yeah, it is possible to do that, but if that's your only strategy, you're really going to be limited in terms of the deals that you can do because everything has to align just right for you to truly make a lot of money in real estate with no money down. Would, would you, uh, would you agree with that? Or is that something that, you know, you actually kind of teach? So I, I say both. I think it's very hard to do, um, to do something with nothing. So uh, I do a lot of, or I, or I used to do a lot of um, wholesaling and, and contract assigning. And, right. um, and as I, as I moved from the good market to the crazy market we're in now, I got involved in, in some new construction. So I would tear down houses and build new so I didn't have time to do a lot of rehabbing because when you're building new homes and I'm, I'm not naturally a home builder, so I didn't grow up doing that, even though I grew right. up around it, my family wasn't in the business. So I had to learn that from the ground up. So what I, what I did was this is when I was building new construction, I would start assigning deals now and then because I was still talking to private sellers, still working with guys like you and I, or people who are a little bit newer who get themselves in trouble. There's a deal, but they don't know what to do. Right. And I said, I can't put more money into this stuff. I don't want to borrow from here and, and be flipping and get stuck. So I said, in about 2015, all I'm going to do is assign if I'm going to move properties quickly. And that's what I did. But okay. I only did about 40 deals. That was my best year. And to me, I wanted to do 150 deals just because right. I always want to do more. It's not the money necessarily. I just always want to do my best. Just fun so to that, win, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, if you're a hunter and you got a big fat belly, which, which I do, I got a pretty good belly, right? <laughs> but there's a giant deer there. Right. And, and, and I've got my rifle. What am I going to do? I'm going to take that deer out because I'm a hunter. I can't stop right. myself from doing that. But I tell you what, assigning properties is really assigning contracts is really the only way to do it with absolutely no money at all. Yeah. You can borrow and do and do, and do, and do, and do but you still got to have money for marketing. You still got to have some kind right. of cash somewhere. Right. And it is very, very difficult to keep all those plates spinning at one time or like the globe trotters, right? They had five, 10, 12 basketballs spinning at one time at halftime, because if one thing falls apart on an assignment deal, you don't get paid. If you right. don't know how to do contracts, right? Have the right title company or closing attorney. You don't have control of the seller, keep them in, under control, have control of the buyer, keep them under control, have control of the money where the buyer's money's coming from half the time. There's a lot going on. So you earn your stripes or you earn your money when you assign. So I don't ever dissuade people and say, you can't do it without any money. But like going back to what I mean, uh, originally said, James, you should always be working on getting more capital behind you from private right. lenders, private sources, because there's three things that you and I should be doing, right? We should be looking for deals, looking for money or, or selling deals or, or something, right? I don't care if yep. it's deals or, or, or whatever else we're selling, but as business owners, we shouldn't be worried about what paint color goes on there. We should have that right. figured out. We shouldn't be worried about, um, you know, things that don't aren't revenue generating. And the more often and every day, the more revenue generating, like if you look at our bucket for the day, I always say like, there's like three beakers. It's like red, yellow, and green, just like uh, a stoplight. 
You want green to be as high as possible. You want red to be as low as possible. And you don't really want any yellow. You don't want to be in the middle either. Right. You know, you, right, you right. only want green, but we have to work on that. Right. So as new real estate investors, if you're watching this, you always want to be focusing on generating revenue somehow because the other stuff just doesn't get you paid. Do I still right. do a ton of stuff I shouldn't do yet? Do you do stuff you shouldn't do? Sure. Sometimes we, we like what we're doing though, too. I like helping new people. I coach people. I'm, I'm not a paid coach. I don't, have, I don't have mentoring in that sense, but I'll help newer people if they give, if I can tell they're good folks, because it makes me feel good. You know, it fulfills me to do that. But I can't do that for 10 hours a day. I can do it for like 20 minutes a day or right. maybe 20 minutes a week. Because if I don't make money, then, then I can't help them either. Yeah, I think one of the things that entrepreneurs all share is that, first of all, it's that hunter mentality, right? You know, you use the analogy of a deer, but, you know, whatever it is, you know, it, it doesn't, you know, you're not doing it based on need. You're, you're doing it based on, on drive and having a plan and executing on the plan. And so, you know, you mentioned, you know, helping newer people, you know, et cetera. You know, we do a lot of that as well. And it's, it's, that's not really a revenue generating thing that you do, but I think, one of the things that most entrepreneurs have in common is you remember, Hey, it was just like yesterday that that was me. And somebody reached out, somebody helped me. And that kind of put us over the edge and, you know, put us on the path to where we are today. So I think most entrepreneurs, as long as, you know, the, the newer person is, you know, got the drive and the determination. If, if you identify a little bit of, you know, Hey, that was me just, you know, a little bit ago, you're, you're super willing to help that person. And, I know that that's something that we both, you know, share in common and we'll, yeah, we, we've, we've got a business to run. So we, you know, we can't spend a tremendous amount of time doing that, but that is one of the more fun things that we do. Um, looping back to the, to the private money piece of that, because I, I totally agree with you that, uh, you know, assignments are really the only effective way to do that. The reason that I tell people that, you know, haven't done their first deal that, Hey, it's really tough to set up a business and launch it, no money down. I mean, it is possible to do, but assignments are pretty much the only way to do that, you know, consistently. And the thing is without, you know, some, some significant marketing spend and some systems and processes, it's tough to do much of that. So you, you really have to just work hard and plow everything back in. I totally agree that, you know, raising money, that's, that's one of my, you know, primary jobs is, you know, establishing and expanding our banking relationships, our private money relationships, you know, we use the banks for the, you know, long-term stuff for rentals and things. Um, and, you know, we, we haven't had a, as much success with private money lenders that want to write a 30 year note, but, you know, we can get that from banks rates are low, but we go after private money and, and we've had, you know, some success in doing that, but I know you've had, you know, a lot more success in that, in that respect than we have. And for a lot longer period of time, what can you tell people about how to raise, you know, private money? If you're new, getting started out, you know, what do you look for and how do you talk to people about that? Well, so I'm sure you were able to tell Dylan's got a tremendous amount of experience and knowledge in this business. He's been at this for a long time doing a lot of different things. So make sure and tune in for the next episode where we're going to pick up right where we left off and Dylan's going to jump into the strategies that he uses to bring in private money and work with private money in funding his projects and making his investors happy and helping to fuel his business. So if you're liking what you're seeing, hit that subscribe button below, turn on notifications, because we want you to know every time we post new content, which is gonna have actionable things, just like what Dylan's been talking about today. And you're gonna to wanna to see the rest of this interview. Trust me, it only picks up from here. So until then, Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.